Welcome to the Men of Iron Podcast, equipping men for growth in your faith, family, friends, fitness, and finances. Check out menofiron.org to learn more about how you can get involved in or support the vision of changing a culture one man at a time. Thanks for listening. Here's your host, Chad Zook. Gentlemen, welcome to the Men of Iron Podcast. This is episode 89, and we're talking about encouragement that works. My name is Chad Zook. I'm the host of the show. My guess is this, and it's just a hunch, that some of us, perhaps most of us, aren't that good at encouraging. So we need encouragement that works. In this podcast episode, I'm going to give you four keys to being a better encourager so you can find out the truth that encouragement really works. Do you know anyone who smiles or laughs a lot? You know the type. They can be obnoxious, misunderstood, and yet mysteriously magnetic at the same time. They seem to live as if they aren't bogged down by the burdens of life or the triviality of petty arguments. They're the type of humans that I want to be around. Most likely, they're the type of humans that you want to be around. A couple weeks ago, I had a conversation with a guy like this. We were bantering back and forth, and we were actually just making jokes really about my father-in-law. He's a, a mutual friend of this individual and myself. And so they gave us plenty of material for the comedic relief as we're sitting there talking. Something was interesting about him, though, about the individual that I'm talking to. You see, we were just talking, and it was just like this natural Uh, something natural about him that was just exuding positivity and encouragement. He had a smile on his face, not in a fake way, but just in a way to just put everybody else at ease. And his laugh was contagious. I've said it this way, the conversation was like a pinata that showered more and more laughter over us. There was nothing inappropriate, no like locker room talk. He was hilarious. And when he laughed, everyone heard, everyone noticed and everyone seemed to put a smile on their face at the same time. Remember when you were a kid and your mom told you to smile for those family pictures? I hated it. You probably did too. There was nothing more painful to me than smiling on command. It seemed so fake, and I just could not stand the fact that I had to smile on command when I didn't really want to smile at all. But yet, if we're honest, somehow moms everywhere still make these silly demands... And these demands of us, you know, they're troubling sometimes because we not only have to push past the fact that we may think it's fake or whatever we're feeling that they're thinking at the time. But for me, even (laughs) just as a little side note, for me growing up, my my smile was lopsided. On on one side, it would be normal. The other side, it was kind of like not normal. It was kind of weird, but I I couldn't tell that it was that way. So you can imagine how tragic this was as a middle school boy. But uh, eventually I learned about the imbalance, and now I overcompensate (laughs) to deal with this ethical dilemma. And if you see pictures of me smiling, just know that I am pulling it off without anyone else knowing it. Here's the interesting interesting thing about smiling. You see, your brain throws a feel-good party every time you smile. A smile generates neural messages. These neural messages are keys to relieving stress, pain relief, and engaging the feel-good neurotransmitters like dopamine, endorphins, or serotonin. Amazingly, these neurotransmitters are released every time you smile. It's a crazy thing. It's an amazing thing. And smiles are also contagious. God has wired us humans to smile when we see other people smile. I believe it's just this divine conspiracy gets pessimism and negativity. I don't know if that's true. Maybe a stretch. But I can tell you this isn't. The more you smile the more others around you will smile. And the more you encourage others, the more they too will encourage others. Bob Goff, the New York Times bestselling author, has this effect on me. When I read his books, I just I seem to smile and wonder. When I listen to him speak, and I've had the opportunity of hearing him live a couple times, I, I just smile with ease. When I watch him, his smile ignites my smile. He, in his book, Love Does, he inspired these questions, and I think that will be things that will help us before we get into, ultimately, the, the four kind of takeaways, if you will, to help us to be better encouragers. 
these four questions based off of uh, his book, Love Does, based out of, rather. What if the best thing you could offer the world is a smile? What if your wife and kids need smiles more than advice? What if your advice would be better heard after some belly laughter? I know it seems cheesy, but it's true. What if you were so encouraging that people were naturally drawn to you? Proverbs eleven twenty five says this, Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So there's a, a way that when we refresh others and we encourage one another, whether it's a smile, whether it's just positivity, whether it's just outright encouragement, that too will come back to us. You see, us needing encouragement, it doesn't make us weak. It just makes us human. And although maybe we are blustering guys and we think we're big and tough and we don't need encouragement, we're kind of fooling ourselves. We do need encouragement. We just don't need it to be weird. That's what we really are afraid of, I believe. We just don't want it to be weird. So how can you and I become the type of guys that others would want to be around, that we become natural encouragers? That's really the, the big question of this podcast. So what is encouragement itself? I'll give you the biblical way of understanding encouragement. Biblical encouragement isn't focused on complimenting someone's haircut or telling them, wow, man, you look, you know, you're really getting swole at the gym, or you're saying, wow, you can really, you know, barbecue those ribs. That kind of encouragement is important, and the ribs are good, right? But, but the encouragement that scriptures talk about is explicitly Christian encouragement. So I want to lean into that. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, I think that there's a part of this that you can engage with even if you are not uh, totally bought into the Christian way of life. You see, encouragement is shared with the hopes of lifting someone's heart up and ultimately lifting someone's heart towards the Lord if you're a Christian. That's what it says in Colossians 4.8. It points out evidences of grace in someone's life to help them see what you see and to help them see what God is up to. It points a person ultimately to God's promises that assures them that whatever they face is actually under God's control. The New Testament, I'll lean in a, a little further with this, the New Testament reveals that encouragement was a regular part of the early church's life together. And I think we've missed this. I think we've been afraid for multiple reasons, but I think we are, just don't know how. And we just have been socially kind of adapted to not be natural encouragers. But the, the scriptures give all sorts of ways that there are just these words uh, to help spur one another on uh, in encouragement. So there are scripture-saturated words to encourage and spur one another on that talk about hope and unity and joy and strength and fruitfulness, faithfulness, perseverance, and also the return of Jesus himself. Encouragement was and is an essential way of extending grace to one another. And if we get this right, there's, it's an amazing thing that I think that, that we will ultimately see with these four keys to being better encouragers. The same thing that was said in Proverbs 11.25, that whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So when we choose to adapt ourselves and become encouragers, we too will be encouraged by our efforts and the way that that encouragement reciprocates back to us. So I'm going to give you the four keys. Not going to take long. Some of these are going to be very, very simple, but simple as what we say here at Men of Iron. Simple doesn't always mean easy. So don't mistake those two words. Simple does not always mean easy. It takes effort. It takes work. But you're a man, so you should know hard work, and you should know the value of being intentional. So the four keys of being a better encourager. First one is this. Start with you. Don't neglect your own wellness or well-being. Go for a run. Go for a walk. Spend time alone with God. Develop some gratitude practices. You can go a bunch of different places. It's, it's like a hot-button thing, talking about gratitude, which is helpful, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it because it's everywhere, and it's kind of played out, to be honest with you. But it's important nonetheless. So practice some gratitude uh, and whatever those practices are, whether you write it down or whether it's just a time of quiet meditation or whatever, journaling, whatever it is that you choose, but spend time alone with God. And what you're doing, when you start with you and you start with your wellness, you understand that the only way that you can give encouragement is if you have been encouraged and that you have been refreshed by the Lord. 
There's a way that, that I like to think about this, and I've actually applied this in a talk I gave a few years ago. It's this very simple phrase that I think helps us in this regard. And, and it seems a little counterintuitive because I'm starting with the first key to being a better encourager is start with you. But I, I want to lean into that and kind of take this apart just a little bit. So here's the phrase or the quote that I've, I've given multiple times. The less I think about me, the more thankful I will be. Here's what I mean. Start with you, but yet when it comes to like this quote, the less I think about me, what I'm thinking about is your circumstance. The less you think about your circumstance, the less you think about the implications on your life, the less you think about how bad it is for you, the less you think about how much hard work it's going to take of you, the less, the, the less I think about me in all of those things I just talked about, the more thankful I will be. If we can take ourselves out of the equation and remove ourselves from the situation that maybe we're dealing with, because we're always dealing with situations, we're going to be more thankful generally, and we're going to be more encouraging. We're going to have more to give other people. I know it could be confusing. The less I think about me, what I'm talking about is the me of my circumstances, my, my hardships, and, and it just leads us to pride, and it leads us to hubris. It leads us to inflated ego, and ultimately, in that type of attitude, keeps us from being thankful and keeps us from being encouraging because we don't notice other people or what it is that God is up to around us. So start with you. Start with you. Don't neglect your own wellness or well-being. Get outside of your own head. The less I think about me, get outside of your head and your circumstances. Write that stuff down. Talk to God about it. When you start with you, you can become a better encourager by doing that. The second key is this. Learn to listen. And part of this learning to listen is, is just asking better questions. And they're, they're better questions as simple as this. You may not even know what it is that you're supposed to do or what it is that you can do to encourage whether your wife or your kids or a friend or your boss or, or your neighbor, whoever. But one of the ways I think is, guys, we, we just need simplifying questions. So I'm going to give you three simplifying questions and this will put you in a situation as you're learning to listen, and a bit of, it will put you in a situation to use the next key, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So here are the three questions that will help you learn to listen. First question is this. Ask this. What do you need from me right now? What do you need from me right now? And then listen. Listen to what the individual says. If they say, I don't know, then you listen some more. If it's your wife, if she says, I just need you to listen— Chances are she doesn't need you to give a list of three things that, that you're telling her to do as soon as the thing is over. She's not ready for that yet. What she needs to do is do what she told you. Just listen. So ask the question, what do you need from me right now? And another way you could ask the same question is, you know, not to necessarily ask them the question out loud, but, but you could ask this question to yourself as you're talking to someone. What do they need from me right now? So th those two things, think about those two questions really wrapped up into one. The next one is this. Who can I be for you in this moment? Who can I be for you in mo this moment? Can I be an encourager for you in this moment? Can I be a listener for you in this moment? Can I, can I just be a sounding board for you in this moment? Can I be the voice of reason in this moment? Can I be the, you know, the devil's advocate in this moment? But I think that's, a, that's an important question to ask. Who can I be in this moment? And then position yourself to do that. And then the, the third question is this. Just a very simple, clear-cut question. How can I help? How can I help? This puts us in a situation once we're learning to listen and we're engaging a person, we're asking these questions of ourselves or, or them, and puts us in a position to go to the next key, the next step, if you will. The first one was start with you. The second was learn to listen. The third is use words and actions. Use words and actions. One of the ways that this may be helpful for you of people within your home specifically, when uh, we're trying to position ourselves to know what it is that we're supposed to do or what who it is they need us to be in this moment, uh, if we're going to use words and actions we probably ought to know what the person's love language is. Now, if this is just a guy you're mentoring, you're probably not going to have all this. That gets into Weirdville. I'm talking about those in your home, your kids, your wife. What are their love languages? Read the book. It's a really, take the test about 
love languages. We can put this in the show notes. Of course, there are five different love languages that are mentioned. There's acts of service, gifts, quality time, words of affirmation, and physical touch. I don't know this for sure, but I'd be willing to bet that people enjoy receiving encouragement in the same manner in which they like showing it. I can tell you that's what I did for years, years of our marriage, and it led me to frustration. I would I would try to encourage my wife in the way that I want to be encouraged. And yet I would just it would just seem like it would just fall on deaf ears. I'm like, why is this not working? It's because that's not her love language. My job was not to give her love in the way that I want to receive love, but it's to give love and encouragement in the way that she needs to receive that love and encouragement. And it's up to me as a man and the husband to find out what that is. So I'll say it just a little bit more in this regard. Imagine someone who shows or receives love through acts of service, but rarely through words. So you're always doing something, always always an act of service, always an act of service, always an act of service, but rarely through words. But maybe all you needed to do was just to tell somebody, Real, you, you really are crushing that. And yet we exert all this energy in these acts of service, but don't have the, the real uh, benefit that we think it's going to have. Instead, you can just encourage them with words, right? That's such a simple example, but it, but it works, and it's so true. Uh, so you, you may be able to go on the other side of the spectrum. You can encourage somebody in a conversation all you like, and, and yet words just kind of fall deaf on their ears. And yet what, they, what would be better in that situation is to you know, buy somebody a cup of coffee, buy your wife some flowers, take your kid out for an, for an ice cream after they've done a really good job at school or, you know, they got a home run, you know, at the baseball game or softball game or whatever the case may be. And yet maybe just in those words, it just doesn't resonate like we think it is. Instead, it'd be better suited to just go out and have this act of service to say, you know what? I see you. I appreciate you. I notice what you did. And I want to affirm that. And it could be uh, like for your wife, it could be cooking her dinner. It could be just taking her out, like surprising her to say, you know what, you've been crushing it and we've been maybe crushing it together. And I just want to go out and just, I just want to go out tonight and just enjoy this night out to celebrate what you have done. That's a very encouraging way to do it. Now let's drill down a little, even a little bit further about using words and actions. We need to be wise. We need to be wise specifically when we talk about encouraging somebody the opposite sex. And using discernment is how best to do this. Uh, I also, anytime that I have to encourage somebody the opposite sex, I always loop my wife in, let her know what's going on. If I send a, uh, if I send a message to somebody of the opposite sex t- to encourage them, I will, uh, I will either loop in that if they're married, I will either loop in that woman's husband, or I will loop in my wife. That way, just being wise about the situation. And so nothing inappropriate happens, but yet I've looped another person in here when that encouragement happens because I'm being wise about it because of the temptations that could come. And I realize it may sound a little hokey, it may sound a little old-fashioned, but you know what? I will dare to think, uh, I will dare to lean into the reality that you may think um, that I'm hokey or old-fashioned, but I'm going to keep my morals. So that's more important to me than what somebody else thinks is right about me. And a lot of times when it comes to being wise also, um, it's just, again, leaning into this, those five different love languages. What is the, what is the thing that I'm going to get the most benefit on the other side of this? You can, uh, just this idea about being wise, you can just understand that, that men take encouragement and they receive encouragement different than women. So you don't want to be condescending if you're encouraging a guy. So a way to do that is the next key, be specific, be specific, you know, be specific on what you're encouraging them for. So especially if you're going to not make it weird, encourage a guy, be specific. Don't be so, don't be general, be like, wow, you did a really good job. It's like, you did a really good job of closing that deal. You really did a good job of reaching that financial goal or that faith goal or that fitness goal or that family goal or taking your wife on a date. Be specific about what you're encouraging them about. Being specific helps so much more than what we think that it does. And and it actually affirms particular behaviors instead of general behaviors that 
um, then just don't really land where we think they will. Another way of being specific is if you want to encourage somebody who's struggling, you need to get to know the difficulty that that person is facing. Again, go back to some questions. How can I help? What are you, you know, what are you struggling with? What, what, what's going on behind the scenes? These are the type of questions we can ask ourselves or ask these people. But get to know the difficulty that the people are facing without downplaying it. So don't, don't treat their issue as if it's so small, like, you know, in a condescending way, like, oh, really? You're struggling with that? Like, you are such a wuss. If you would just man up right now, just toughen up, you probably wouldn't have to deal with this. You have such a fragile ego, right? That's not very encouraging. And more than likely, if you just treat every person, you know, like a whack-a-mole, uh, you're not going to have very many people around you. They won't be around you very long, and you will be alone very, very shortly. So you should probably get to know who it is that you're talking to. Don't downplay the struggle they're dealing with. Get involved. Ask those questions. Be wise. Be specific on what you're encouraging them about. And I'll just add another one under be specific. And this one, I tell you, I'm the worst offender at this. Don't be preachy. Don't be preachy. I'm an Enneagram One, also known as the perfectionist. If there is something wrong with a person or something wrong in the room, I'm the one who sees it. And I have this inner voice, the inner critic is what it's called, that is this belief that I have to be the one to fix it. And I can come across so preachy and so like even unconcerned or with lack of care. And if I'm going to be encouraging, I have to get off of the high horse that people think that I'm on. And I have to learn how to gain some emotional intelligence, to take some deep breaths, and to learn how to listen more and speak less. Again, I'm the worst offender. You cannot be worse at this than I am. And yet I'm, I'm on the journey to not be preachy when I hear people who are struggling with things, and even if I think it's not that big of a deal, I'm not going to be preachy. I'm just going to encourage them. Um, I'm either going to encourage them by listening, I'm going to encourage them by affirming good behavior, or I'm going to encourage them by giving them some steps to back away from bad behavior. Another thing is this. Help them see a positive in the situation. Help them see a positive in the situation. And there's so many different examples of this, but yet we tend to only see the negative. And what, what, if we're going to encourage somebody, we need to help them see what they don't see. So help them see the positive in a situation. Another question that, that guys maybe ask is, can I just text someone? Of course you can, especially if you're not going to see them face to face. Texting may help. And let me just give you a couple uh, a couple clues as to maybe some text and get you going in the right direction. Here's eight different ideas to kind of text to help encourage someone. So in, in just texting to encourage specifically not to discourage bad behavior, but only to encourage good behavior or right behavior. So the first uh, text you could give is, hey, whenever you need to call, I'm here. The second one is this. I wish I could be there right now. This is, this is your attempt at empathy. The third one is this. Dude, you're in a hard place right now, and I'm praying for you. Another one is, hey man, you're leading well in a tough situation. Uh, the, the fifth would be this. You're still in my thoughts and prayers. The sixth would be, I really appreciate the way you fill in the blank. Again, goes back to that specific. I really appreciate the way you, and then be specific about what you're encouraging. Or something very short like this. The seventh is, hey, get well soon. Or the eighth, and more general, you're doing a great job. Keep crushing it. That's, that's in the situation if you just don't know exactly what to say, but yet you want, you want them to know that you notice them and that you see them. So just say, you're doing a great job. Keep crushing it. Again, it may seem pithy, Trust me, they work. That's not weird. When you receive these, as I've received these texts, it's super encouraging and reminds me as a man to stay in the fight, keep doing the good work that the Lord has for me. The last takeaway is this. The last key is practice. Practice. And with that, don't beat yourself up if it doesn't come naturally. So what, what you need to do is you need to make encouragement a daily discipline. For some of us, 
It may be uh, putting a, a date on your calendar every day to give yourself a reminder to send an encouraging note, email, text, or phone call. You may need this reminder just to pause and pray just and then to intentionally um, to allow have the Lord you know how have the Lord to remind you of of getting outside of yourself again, the less I think about me, the my circumstances, my pain, my problem, my whatever, all my struggle, the more thankful I will be. So to help with that is is just to remember to pause and pray. And allow the Lord to, to bring us outside of our circumstances, outside of our own head, outside of our own story, so we can encourage somebody else while they're leaning heavy into their own. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I'll say it in this way. Whoever encourages others will be encouraged. We want to change a culture one man at a time. When we embrace the reality of encouragement is needed, it's valuable, and not weird, We indeed can change the culture in our home, in our workplace, in our mentorships, in our faith communities. This Men of Iron podcast is brought to you by Men of Iron. If you're interested in getting involved in or supporting the vision of changing a culture one man at a time, or you simply want to know more about our Strong 27 mentorship experience, equilibrium retreats, Anchor Man video series or Men of Iron Plus, go to menofiron.org.